are listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. I'm Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. We're both lifelong hunters, deer biologists, professors of wildlife management, and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. We explain the latest research, including our own work and that conducted elsewhere. So if you're interested in deer biology and management, this is your podcast. Every decision you make is a step in your management program, and we give you the knowledge to make every decision count. Welcome back to the Deer University podcast. We are delighted and excited today to introduce a topic that has been, uh, I guess, the focus of some blood, sweat, and tears. Maybe less the tears, but certainly a lot of sweat. And it has been the uh, the topic of supplemental feeding, which we'll go into a little more detail on how common of a practice that is. but. What we wanted to look at was what are some of these indirect effects, consequences potentially of supplemental feeding. Steve, we've talked about many times about uh, the impacts of supplemental feeding on deer Mm -hmm. and largely lack thereof, unless you're doing it right. Uh, But we wanted to look at some of the more uh, indirect effects and specifically today's topic is what are the potential for various diseases that could be introduced to a deer population. So, Steve, welcome. Yeah. Hey, great to be back with us on uh, the podcast. So, diseases are, are like the common concern of biologists. They, uh, whenever a landowner or a hunter talks about feeding deer, the, the biologist quickly pulls out of their po- back pocket. Well, you know, we got to be careful about supplemental feeding because it's concentrating deer and you know wildlife diseases of wildlife generally aren't a big problem under normal circumstances if they're living in their habitat they're going to have some parasites relatively low levels wildlife generally are adept at dealing with parasites and diseases under normal circumstances especially when they're healthy yes when the habitat is quality the animals are quality they're, they're in good shape and they're not going to have a problem generally. However, when we artificially change the environment uh, or allow the quality of the environment to go down because there are too many deer, you know, when it's less than ideal, disease uh, can increase in a population and possibly have consequences. So. We don't want to overemphasize the fact that diseases and supplemental feeding go hand in hand. It's just because we know supplemental feeding doesn't cause disease. It's the disease agent, whatever the individual actual cause of a disease, we call that the disease agent. And then we talk about the host for the disease and the environment. Uh, be in the place where the animal lives and the disease vector or the disease agent lives. So we got three, think of it as three circles, and each of those circles are can be independent. So that disease agent might be somewhere in the environment, and in that same area there might be animals, and there might be habitat that's conducive to the disease agent existing. But unless you have all three of those circles overlapping, you're not going to have a disease problem. So when we manipulate things or artificially change something or poorly manage the population, we can increase the relative sizes of those circles and increase the overlap and increase the prevalence of disease. So that's when Steve, it, it sounds like you're in your uh, wildlife disease class giving a lecture. Oh, it I'm sounds sorry. like you've done this before. Well, we do talk about uh, this a little bit in my wildlife diseases class, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Steve, the, the way I express it a lot, if I'm given a seminar on the topic of supplemental disease, uh, <laughs> just, 
<laughs> some little feeding and disease comes up. Um, I, I guess the way I express it is supplemental feeding does not cause disease, but it can facilitate the spread of, of disease if there is a disease agent within that population. Yes. Is that an accurate way that to is convey accurate. that concept? Okay. Going out to eat prior to COVID-19 being around didn't cause people to get sick with COVID. It wasn't until the COVID was brought in that, hey, we need to reduce the seating density at, at restaurants yeah. to manage the concentration of people once the disease agent entered the environment. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen these principles of disease management applied in the last year. Yeah, good, uh, good, good analogy there. So Steve, this has, you, you brought in the tie of, this has been an issue, uh, a, a concern for biologists for a long time. Would you say that's kind of the impetus for what we're gonna talk about today, which is the, the, this, this project and, and our colleagues at the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks, we all got together and de developed this project to kind of look at these issues a little more closely and quantify them. Yeah, in fact, we're, we're happy to have as our guest today, Miranda Huang, who has uh, been working on her master's degree here at the Deer Lab, and she has a real strong interest in wildlife diseases and how they can impact wildlife and indirectly other animals. And uh, Miranda, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. You've, you've learned a lot about supplemental feeding over the last couple of years while we've been together on this research. How widespread is supplemental feeding? It's fairly widespread. I mean, in Mississippi specifically, we found that over half of deer management assistance program cooperators report using some form of supplemental feeding. And we know that that's true in other states as well. There's data showing that states throughout the U.S. are using supplemental feeding widely. Okay, so it's widespread across North America, probably. And, and even in, in other countries, uh, Europe, they do some supplemental feeding of, of wildlife. Mm -hmm. are, do you have some examples you could share with us where supplemental feeding was associated with a disease either developing or expanding its uh, impacts? Yes, so there's been some great research out of Michigan looking at how supplemental feeding of deer has helped spread bovine tuberculosis both in deer populations, but also in cattle populations up there. So it's had widespread effects. And that's not the only example. Also in Wyoming, where the state runs a supplemental feeding program, they've seen increases in brucellosis in their deer populations. And what is brucellosis? Uh, brucellosis is a disease that can affect a variety of species, such as deer, but also cattle. It's a bacterial disease, so it, it's, it's a type of disease agent. Mm -hmm that represents, uh, you know, not all bacteria are going to be exactly like brucellosis, but it's an example of a disease agent that can be increased in impact by concentrating animals. And exactly. it's been shown in Michigan and, and, and in the West. Steve, I gotta remind you, Miranda passed her thesis <laughs> defense in orals yesterday. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is not a she quiz. She doesn't have for, to answer your questions like that. This is not a quiz of her. I'm just yeah. trying to help our listeners who may not be familiar with what is brucellosis. And she answered it. It's a disease. Yeah. It's a disease. <laughs> One of many. <laughs> well, and there's some examples, what, in Europe? Yes. So, um, in Spain, they do some feeding or baiting to try and keep pigs off of their agricultural lands. And they've actually found that boar that are visiting these feeding sites have higher levels of gastrointestinal parasites compared to boars that don't have access to feeding. Hmm. Okay, so concentrating the, the, the hogs at these feeding sites increases the occurrence of the intestinal parasites. Exactly. Okay, so worms. The worms. Worms in their bellies. Worms in their bellies. How's that, that, is that good enough? Worms in the bellies is good. <laughs> comes out in the poop. Yes, it mm -hmm. does. We'll talk about poop a little bit more here. Um, Steve, I wanted to, um, I guess I tend to re reduce things down very simply. Um, three things we want to cover today. We want to talk about ticks. We want to talk about parasites and poop. 
and lastly some aflatoxins. So why don't we start with ticks? Before we do that, oh boy, we're changing the game. One plan, more right? little topic. We got to have the the background here. Okay. It's part of my introduction to wildlife diseases. Okay. What what's the word zoonotic referred to, Miranda? What, and why is that important to us? Zoonotic refers to diseases that can affect humans in addition to wildlife. And we find it especially interesting because we know that humans are visiting these feeders, obviously, to fill them, to clean them out, to put up their own trail cameras to observe. And if there are zoonotic diseases at the feeders, it might put the humans visiting them at risk. Okay, so a zoonotic disease is one that is in the animals and it could potentially be transferred to humans. Yes, it can also go the other way, mm -hmm. from humans back to animals. Yeah, and, and the whole uh, COVID Perfect example. pandemic is an example that it was in bats and still is in bats. And there's still some arguments to, about how exactly it got from bats into the human population, but you know, it originated in bats. It's a zoonotic disease, uh, definitely in our, in our thoughts these days. Mm. So it's important if it's a zoonotic disease in particular, not just because of the animals, but back to your comment, uh, Bronson, about the indirect effects. Mm -hmm. If we're impacting, if we're doing something like supplemental feeding to improve our hunting or to improve the health of the, of the animals, we don't want to ourselves get sick in the process. Yeah, the unintended consequence. Yeah. yeah. Your, your intentions are to do good, but what might be the, the consequences of that activity? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ticks. So let's let's talk about ticks. Um, we went into this thinking that we are going to have a lot more ticks around feeders because we have concentrated wildlife around feeders, and in that process, of course, we need to document. You know, are there more uh, wildlife? Are there more deer? at the feeders versus a random spot. Go 100 yards away, go 200 yards away, a random spot in the forest field, etc. And so we did that comparison. And Miranda, I guess the first thing is, there are more deer compared to at random coming to a feeder. Yes. There's also a lot more critters coming to a feeder than just deer. Mm -hmm. So you're feeding a lot more animals than just deer. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what all you saw sure. around the feeders? Well, I think it will probably come as no surprise to any landowners who use feeders that raccoons were our most common visitors to feeders. We saw something like a 15-fold increase in the number of raccoons at feeder sites compared to our sites without feeding. But nearly every animal we noticed on the trail cameras increased. Turkeys, Virginia opossums, humans, as I mentioned earlier, songbirds, other birds. Um, really just visitation in general to these feeder sites is huge. Did you mean possum? I did mean, <laughs> I did mean possum. Good I, old possum, yeah. You know, I spent a few months in Australia and they have so many different species of possums, I still feel the need to be specific. That's the name everybody, everyone around here might recognize it better. That's fair. Good old possum. Yeah. So we went into this thinking that you, you concentrated all these animals. There's probably going to be more ticks or parasites mm -hmm. uh, around the, the feeders. And Miranda, one term I have heard you use many times, I thought it's very interesting relative to ticks. You said yesterday in your master's defense, uh, your presentation, you kept saying quest and questing. What the heck is that? <laughs> it's a great term, right? It's um, the behavior that ticks do to look for hosts, basically. And there are different ways that ticks can quest, look for hosts. And it can be as simple as climbing up on a stalk of grass and waving their little tick arms around, trying to sense the presence of a host. Or what we took advantage of is sometimes they move towards chemical signals like carbon dioxide, which humans and other animals breathe out. So it's a way of sensing that host and facilitating their questing. And that's actually how you, you trapped them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You were using CO2 to put out the signal, and what do you know? They come crawling, walking yeah. in, and you're able to trap them that way. And that's how you did your counts. Exactly. The, where ticks are out on the landscape. So 
you were surprised, and I know I was surprised, that we found fewer ticks, fewer adults, and fewer nymphs, the, the, the different stage of, of the tick. Yeah, what, what is a nymph, Steve? Or Miranda. Do you want me to take it? Sure. So most of the ticks that we deal with are um, three life stage ticks. They come out born as larval ticks, and then they'll, over the winter, usually molt into their next life stage, which are called nymphs. And then one year later, usually, they molt again into adults, which is when they can reproduce, lay eggs, and start the whole cycle again. Miranda, all the time I hear the term, uh, I got into some seed ticks. Mm -hmm. what, is that a nymph? That's a larval tick. That's a larval tick. Mm -hmm. Those okay. are the ones that are about the size of a poppy seed. Okay. Yeah, and those are the ones that are, they, they come out, the, the gravid female, the female that's ready to lay eggs, she'll deposit, you know, thousands of eggs in a spot, or hundreds at least? At least hundreds. Yeah, a whole bunch of eggs in one spot, and when those eggs hatch, you've got literally hundreds of larval ticks, and they, they don't have real long legs, so they just kind of crawl up and, and look for something, they quest, and look for a host. And if you walk by or stand in where there's a bunch of these larval ticks questing, you end up with a whole pile of seed ticks. Been there. Yeah. Been there. Not pretty. Not fun. No. Don't recommend it. And when you, you find one, you think, oh, uh, oh, and then you look, and oh, and there's another one, there's another one, and, and mm. you're like, oh. And then you might find one six hours later that yeah. you missed, and, and it's a little part bit of your body bigger that... because it's had a blood meal, and it's yeah, been, yeah, yeah. All right, bad, bad, bad memories. Well, we don't, we don't need to go there, let's but move on. Yeah. so we have fewer ticks at the feeders. Yes. So what's kind of the math involved here? Why, why aren't there more ticks at feeders if we have all these animals coming in? Well, what we're thinking is causing this is because more animals are coming in, any ticks that are on the ground at that site are more likely to be able to find a host. They're going to have a successful questing event. Um, and then once they've quested successfully, they're on the host, they're no longer on the ground for me to trap, which means that it's going to look like there are fewer ticks. But it might actually be that if we looked at the animals going to these feeder sites, we'd find more ticks on them. And we weren't able to do that animal sampling. Yes, we were a little limited in what we could accomplish in two years. Yeah. You, you accomplished a huge amount. <laughs> right, uh -huh. right. But wasn't that one potential explanation, Miranda, but, but maybe also that, like you're saying, all these other critters are coming in mm -hmm. to the feeder. There's also some tick predators. There are. Could be. Yes, there's some species of wildlife that eat ticks. I mean, they're plenty nutritious, all filled up with other animals' blood. Uh, a couple of examples of these are turkeys and possums. Mm. Yes, possums are known to eat up to 2,000 ticks in one season. So even just, you know, a change of one or two possums in an area could really affect tick numbers. Wow, so we need to promote possums. Give a possum a break, would you? <laughs> yeah. That's a good critter to have on the landscape. Very good. Save, save your ticks, eat, uh, save, no. <laughs> there's, a, there's a saying, there's a bumper sticker there somewhere. Like, save your possums, help your tick problem or something. Yeah, maybe it's the, uh, the, the little circle with the diagonal line through it, you know, and maybe that's over a tick, and then you have a heart for possum. Yes. Maybe something I like, like that. I like, like it. it. Yeah. Keep an eye out on the MSU Deer Lab website for this new merch. Yeah, yeah, there'll be shirts, <laughs> caps, bumper stickers, that's right. <laughs> yes, you heard like about it here Miranda first. Thinks. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, I guess, so what, what's our take home? We, we found something that, at least to me and my finite knowledge and brain, was counterintuitive. We went uh, into it thinking we're going to find a lot more ticks. Um, we found just the opposite in terms of being around adjacent to these feeders. Uh, and it makes else? sense after we, after we thought about the math involved, the amount of time that a tick is going to be on a deer, for example. It's gonna feed on that deer for days, maybe a week before it falls off. And the likelihood of a tick falling off right when the deer is near the feeder is very small relative to the amount of time 
that the deer spends away from the feeder. 99% of the time the deer is going to be away from the feeder and that's when the, de- the most likely chance of a tick falling off and laying the egg mass uh, if it's a gravid female. So it makes sense. Yeah. Even I guess going in we were thinking that we would see more ticks because more animals but that's why we do research. We don't always know the answer. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Now in addition to fewer ticks though you, you tested all of the ticks you recovered for potentially zoonotic diseases. What are some of the diseases that we currently know about that ticks can cause in humans? Well, the one that probably our listeners are most likely to have heard of is Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a big tick-borne disease, especially in the Northeast, but also it's slowly moving south and west. Mm -hmm. Um, It's becoming a bigger problem in the Midwest as well. Yeah, we've had people here at the, the deer lab get Lyme disease. You know, it's just, it's part of being an outdoors person. Oh, you yeah, have to yeah. search for ticks after you get out and make sure you pull them off. And if you mm-hmm. get that roundish kind of bullseye circle uh, around where your tick was, you need to go uh, get checked out and, and possibly treated for Lyme disease. Right. Because it's something that can cause significant impact to a person if untreated easily cured. It's a bacterial infection and antibiotics kill it really easily. But if you don't get it treated, it can actually develop into some uh, serious arthritic, arthritis-like symptoms after a year or two. So so, something important, an example of a zoonotic disease that ticks carry. What did you happen to find in your ticks? We found some species of Ehrlichia and Rickettsia, and I mean, obviously those are scientific terms, so for anyone who doesn't happen to have a strong background in bacterial tick-borne diseases, um, Ehrlichia is a whole genus of bacteria. One of the species in it causes Ehrlichiosis, which will cause flu-like symptoms in dogs, humans, and other animals. There are also a variety of rickettsial diseases that are zoonotic, uh, such as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is a big one. Yeah, a lot of people probably have heard mm-hmm. of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Mm-hmm. Uh, one that one rickettsial agent that we found is Rickettsia parkeri, which is relatively new to our understanding of disease agents. It causes American Bhutanese fever, which is similar to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but a little more mild. Okay, so these are found in the ticks that you sampled. Rickettsia parkeri is. Parker, yeah. mm-hmm. So th- there are diseases in the ticks that people are exposed to, and we're not saying you need to go out and start a feeding program to decrease the tick numbers. You just need to be smart outdoors people, and, and when you get ticks, pull them off as quick as possible. And if you get symptoms developing, go to your doctor and say, I have these symptoms. They might be like flu. However, I'm an outdoors person, and maybe there's a tick disease, is there a tick disease that could cause this symptom? Yeah. Just being smart. And especially if you picked one off that was feeding on you. That's right. You need to bring that to their attention. That's right. So we had fun with ticks. Mm -hmm. Uh, If that's possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, Miranda had fun. I did have fun with ticks. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Another thing you did, you, you were like the poop lady. I was the poop lady. <laughs> a great nickname. Oh, you, you, you sampled for feces mm-hmm. and, and collected in a, in a, what radius around the feeders? Uh, 25 meters, so about 25 yards. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you also sampled this uh, random effect now uh, location. And it's not totally random. It's, it's in a, an equivalent ecological context. So if the feeder is on the edge of a pine stand versus, uh, next to a field, mm-hmm. you went and found another pine stand and field nearby that didn't wasn't near a feeder and you sampled that. So it's an equivalent situation that would be uh, similar, have similar conditions Right. And so we're trying to isolate the potential impact of the feeder presence. And you sampled, what, 17 different properties? Throughout Mississippi, throughout yes. Throughout Mississippi and 79 different sites, pairs of sites. Mm-hmm. So you get a lot of data behind this. Yes. 
So what what did you find, and what kind of poops? You know, I mean, you, uh, you talked about the animals you saw. Did the the poop piles relate back to the animals you saw on the cameras? They did, except some animals have pretty specific behaviors regarding where they're where they will poop. So, for example, raccoons tend to. Uh, form these things called latrines, and it's, you know, similar to a human latrine, right? It's where they put all of their poop. They like to pick one spot in the woods. They're very hygienic with their poop. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> this didn't stop us from occasionally finding a racco- raccoon poop, like, right in the middle of a trough feeder. But, yes, we did tend to find less raccoon poop because of that behavior that they exhibit. Okay. Uh, but we did find plenty of deer poop and raccoon poop and some wild hog poop. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I can see that. That's a problem to any feeding program. Mm-hmm. If you've got pigs, that's going to be going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. So, what did you find in the poop? Sure. So, yes, being the poop lady, I got to take this nice steaming poop that I found in the woods back to the lab and mush <laughs> it up to look for parasites. And when I looked in it, I found a couple different species. We they're called coccidia and strongylids. And they both are some gastrointestinal parasites, you know, that same kind of worms in the tummy issue that anything that catches it will have, to say it politely, gastric distress. Ooh. Whether it will be, you know, the front end or the back end. <laughs> One or the other. <laughs> I hope it's, that's going to be bad. Yeah. One way or the other, it's going to be bad, yeah. All right. And so we looked at that at our sites with feeders and our sites without feeders, and we found that at a feeder, it's going to increase three to four and a half times. There's gonna just be three times as many strongylids at a feeder site and four and a half times as many coccidia. So that, as a relative risk, is a big increase, just having that much more in the landscape. So a lot of poop means a lot of potential for disease. Exactly. And so then that's a case where the disease agent is present and it's existing in the poop and it's waiting to be contracted by a host and so that's where the animals come in and they're potentially going to pick up that disease but back to the zoonotic connection yes what about uh, these diseases that you documented in the feces any zoonotic potential there there were we did look at a couple that were specifically um, of zoonotic concern and we only found a couple instances of giardia um, but, I mean, one was at a feeder site and one was at a site without a feeder. So it is on the landscape, mm-hmm. but we didn't find enough to really see anything meaningful. Um, uh, Dr. Strickland's over there squinting his eye like Giardia. Are you going you gonna to tell us what Giardia means? Yeah, what is that? Some people refer to Giardia as beaver fever. It's mm-hmm. something that you can get from contaminated water. So it's something that sometimes hikers talk about. If you're going to be drinking out of streams, you might worry about Giardia. Um, but it's also at these Is that sites. where you put the little tablet, you put your canteen in the water and you put a little tablet in there to purify it? Is that primarily the reason yeah. you're doing that? Okay. okay. So that's one that really causes a lot of the gastrointestinal distress. Yeah. Maybe for days and weeks mm. after you get it. So it's really significant consequence. And, and you, you mentioned it is with you found it at both feeders and the ecologically equivalent sites. So it's not a problem with feeders per se, but when you, if the giardia are in the feces and the feces are clearly concentrated many times at the feeders compared to unfed areas of the habitat. So who goes to the feeders? Remind us that a lot of animals, but also what category of Visitation was there? There's also human visitation. Humans yeah. visit at yeah, twice. There's or- a primate that shows up there <laughs> every now and again. Yes. And so if you have a feeder, do you, you know, you're out with the kids, you drive up to the feeder, let's look, go check the feeder, see if it needs some, some replenishing. And the kids get out and they're playing around while you're checking, feeding the, filling the feeder. And, and the kids or, or the dog you know, dogs are going to be sniffing all around the ground and finding some some feces with giardia in it. Mm. Maybe licks it, gets it on its nose, comes back and puts its nose in, in your face. And so there's some consequence potentially. Yeah, definitely increasing the chances with feeding. So 
Feeding is not necessarily bad, but it concentrates animals and potentially increases the risk of exposure to a disease. The unintended consequences. Yes. Yeah. Another uh, problem or another thing that hunters do and, and landowners do is they put out corn as an attractant. Animals like corn, high energy. Mm -hmm. Fat content is pretty good too and not a great source of protein at all, but animals are attracted to high carb, high energy foods, especially in the fall. So there's been a lot of work in the past sampling feed and, and bags of corn and feeders, you know, especially out in Texas and North Carolina, various states have looked at this and some of them have reported very high prevalence rates of aflatoxin. Oh, what is aflatoxin? Aflatoxins are some toxic chemicals that are produced by a few different species of fungus that just kind of exist in the environment. Just like mold will grow in your kitchen, this fungus can grow on corn in your feeder and produce this toxic chemical, aflatoxins. And, and this, these fung, fungus uh, grow on just ag fields, corn ag fields, right? Yeah, and, they do. And so when uh, a farmer is harvesting their corn, before they can take and sell it or store it in a bin somewhere, to, what do you call those, ag co-ops or? Good enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they have to actually test the corn to make sure it's not above some level of aflatoxin. That's right. And, and what happens with corn if it's contaminated with aflatoxin? It can't be used in anything related to the f human digestion. So it can't be given as a feed to dairy cattle because the aflatoxin could get into the milk. It can't be used in... Uh, beef cattle in a, a feedlot mm -hmm. because it can get into the meat. Mm -hmm. So what do they do with it? Well, historically there have been instances where they've sold it for wildlife use instead because there are fewer regulations on that generally. Okay. So it's a potential concern. Yeah. We can't sell it at a premium price for a human product or for livestock, etc. So we'll then sell it at a lesser, we'll get something for it and we'll feed it to wildlife. Yeah, and so past work has shown some pretty high prevalence rates for aflatoxin in corn products. And, and we talk about whole corn, but also uh, a lot of pelleted feeds include corn as an ingredient. So the fact that there's not whole corn in it doesn't necessarily mean there's not a potential problem. That's true. So there's, there's this his history of this being a problem in deer feed. Historically, and so we were interested in, in checking it out and tell us what you learned. Well, we were happily surprised when we sampled our deer feeders, the 79 deer feeders, to find pretty low prevalences of aflatoxins. And one thing that was interesting about our research is we looked both in the summer and the fall because habits for feeding differ at those times, but also the environment differs. And since we're talking about a fungus here, the environment really matters. We kind of figured going into this that in the summer when it's warm and humid, we'd have more of a problem with aflatoxins because they're produced by fungus which need that environment. So when we looked at our feeders in the summer, the prevalence was only around 4% prevalence. And then in the fall feeders is around 6% prevalence. So it's around 5%. Yes, for both of them. Round, round up and down to 5%. That's true. One in 20 feeders had aflatoxin. Some level of aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. And then what level of aflatoxin did you find in the feeders? It was also fairly low for both summer and fall. It was around 60 parts per billion. And since that probably is not going to mean anything to anybody, I'll talk a little bit about the levels of aflatoxins we know affect wildlife. Um, so studies have been done where they've fed animals different concentrations of aflatoxins and looked at what happened. And we know from those that 100 to 200 parts per billion of aflatoxins starts having some negative effects for bobwhite quail and turkey bolts. And then at 800 parts per billion will also have negative health effects for white-tailed deer fawn. So that 60 parts per billion is below those limits, but you know, if it's staying in that feeder over a longer period of time, it can continue to have aflatoxin production and so get to higher the levels. The fungus can continue to grow. It's not just 
whatever it's starting out with. Exactly. Because of the environment and, and fungal fungus will grow. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we we were pleased. We were. That it's not as prevalent. One out of twenty. And the levels are not nearly, I mean, some of the work back in, in the 1990s, I mean, they showed thousands, values of thousands of parts per billion. And, and that's, that's pretty hot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's impacting deer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At, at potentially. Any of our listeners maybe are interested in quail or, or turkey in addition to deer? I, I suspect it is, uh, we're going to have maybe half or so are gonna be also interested in turkey, maybe it's more than that, and a smaller proportion would be interested in, in bobwhites. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and both of those species of game birds showed up at the feeders. They did. Yeah, we have some great pictures of turkeys right in trough feeders, and not just fully grown turkeys, mothers with all of their poults. The poults eating, and that's what the research has been done on, showing that poults are harmed by aflatoxin at certain levels. Right. Okay. And relatively low, 100 parts per billion. I mean, when you think about parts per billion, I mean, it's like, that doesn't even register. Yeah, it's hard to comprehend yeah. that low of a concentration. But but your body can detect it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it harms the turkeys. Mm-hmm. And there have actually been reports of uh, fairly significant regional declines in turkey populations across the southeast in the last 15 to 20 years. And Mm -hmm. turkey biologists are working hard to figure out the cause of it. But there are some turkey biologists that wonder, well, all these people that are feeding deer in the last 20 years, it's increased in prevalence. I wonder if they're spreading aflatoxin across the landscape and hurting the turkeys. Yeah, probably. Um, we got to be careful what we say here because we can't, we didn't test any type of cause and effect with that, but it's logical based on our findings and others that uh, it could contribute. It might be another piece of, of the puzzle for some populations and decline that um, you, you have a, a pretty solid relationship with what you documented, that aflatoxins are associated with corn, um, it grows in the environment when it's spread, and that turkeys and turkey poults are gonna be consuming that. So how widespread, how big of a problem, is that uh, a reason or the largest reason? We don't know. Yeah. But there's certainly merit for some concern yeah. with that. Yeah, just be cognizant, no- yeah. knowledgeable, and that's what our job here is to share knowledge and talk about how it might matter. Mm-hmm. Now, not much aflatoxin in feeders, mm-hmm. and we also sampled bags uh, you know, at the, at the stores. Yes. And what did you find there? So that one was interesting. We didn't just look at Mississippi for that. We went throughout the southeast. Was it six different states? Uh, we sampled bagged and bulk feed of, marketed for wildlife use, and we found the prevalence was a little bit higher. It was around 11%, so one in 10 bags. But the levels were a little lower. Is about 14 parts per billion on average. So barely noticeable, mm-hmm. but at a greater prevalence, one in 10 instead of one in 20. Yes, and with the feed bag, since we talked about it can keep growing, it's not even available to animals yet. You don't know how long it's gonna sit in the store before it's purchased, maybe in someone's shed before they put it out, and then how long it'll be in the feeder before an animal comes and consumes it. There's definitely the potential for it to continue growing. And I know, I know, I don't know if it's how widespread it is, but I've seen properties and I've heard, seen photos of people that just kind of pile corn on the ground or make a homemade uh, corn feeder that they, a piece of PVC pipe that they put the corn in and it kind of falls out the hole at the bottom onto the ground. Mm-hmm. When the corn is associated with the ground, is there a potential for the that to facilitate the growth of aflatoxin producing fungi? Definitely. I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, this fungus just exists in the environment and it can contaminate the feed at any time. And so that's why we did this third study where we looked at the potential for environmental exposure of corn to aflatoxins. And what we did there is we left 
10 piles of corn out in the forest, both in November and as well as in July to look at those seasonal effects. And we covered it up with um, some mesh to prevent any animals from eating it. And Screen, covered it with screen to keep the, the raccoons from coming in yeah. and, and, and the birds from eating it. We just wanted it to be exposed to the environment on the ground for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And then you sampled at different days along that 10 day period for prevalence of aflatoxin and the level. That's right. Now, November hunting season, not a problem at all. Yeah, only one instance of aflatoxins in the 100 samples. Yeah. So, but summertime, and you mentioned earlier, in the environmental conditions, humidity, temperature, those are conducive to fungal growth. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from the summertime on the ground sampling of, of corn? So we left corn on the landscape for 10 days, and we found on days one and three that there were no aflatoxins in any of the 10 piles of corn. And then when we looked on day five, we found that 40% four out of the 10 piles had aflatoxins, and the average level of those was already at 500 parts per billion. 500, that's well above what will harm turkey, poults, and, and quail chicks. Right, that's only one to 200 parts per billion. Okay. And then days eight and 10, every single one of those corn piles had aflatoxins, and the average level was in the thousands. Hot. Very hot. Now you're affecting fawns. Right. Now you're impacting deer. Mm -hmm. Potentially. If they consume it. If yeah. they consumed it. Yeah. Well, somebody might say, well, who puts out corn in the summertime anyway? But what did you find in your, your sampling of those 79 feeders? That's right. In those 79 feeders, we sampled the feed, and it was about 50% protein pellets, but it was also about 50% whole corn and blends that contained corn. And not only that, one of our positives from the feeder was a protein pellet. Since those often contain corn, they are also at risk. Okay. So if you're interested in birds or even fawn production. And you should be. As you should be. <laughs> supplemental feeding and letting it be on the ground or exposed to temperature and moisture in, say, a trough feeder could potentially... Uh, develop aflatoxin at, at toxic levels. That's right. Yeah, and speaking of being interested in birds, we haven't talked too much about non-target animals. There was one study that looked at how aflatoxins affect northern cardinals, just as an example of a songbird species, and it found that levels as low as 25 parts per billion started having effects on the function of their immune system. It made them less able to fight off infections and other diseases. Okay, so it's not just game species, it's the songbirds, mm -hmm. the ones you say, oh, look at how that beautiful cardinal and that bluebird. And well, that has impact to backyard bird feeding as well, your bird feeders. You better clean those up. It's true. Disinfect them. Speaking of disinfecting, how, so how, how would you deal with this problem? There was some great research out of Texas that looked at exactly how much bleach you need to put in your feeder in order to kill both the aflatoxins and the fungus that's producing the aflatoxins. And it was 14%, so one part bleach per eight parts water, I believe. You just wash your feeder down with that, rinse it with water, make sure to let it dry, and then you're good to go to keep going feeding. Okay, and keep it off the ground? Yes, try and keep the feed off the ground. If feed is making contact with the ground, try and remove it within five days, which is, you know, when we saw that real buildup of aflatoxins and the corn on the ground that we looked at. Yeah, and it didn't just occur on day five. It, I mean, it wasn't there day three. It was there in fairly high amounts day five, so it probably started to, you know, develop shortly after day three. That's so, true. The less time on the ground, the better. Yeah. And wildlife tend to be pretty sloppy when they're at a feeder. There's a lot of spillage. I've seen feeders with a lot of feed around the base of the feeders. Mm -hmm. So it's a potential concern. We, we need to be careful. If you go to the effort and the cost of feeding your wildlife, you're doing it because you want to benefit the wildlife. Do it so that you're not harming them. So I guess 
we need to wrap up here with, I think where you were going there, Steve, is uh, if this is something, if this is a behavior you choose to do, if you're going to supplementally feed, um, what are our best management practices for doing that? What is the, or what, what are the situations where you are most likely to benefit your animal populations versus have these unintended consequences, as well as to the, the person that's doing the feeding. So why, why don't we kind of wrap up with uh, some one, two, and three, do this, don't do that. Okay, well we already talked a little bit about keeping your feeders clean with bleach to try and prevent any aflatoxin production in the feeder. Another thing you can do is pay attention to the feed you're buying. A lot of feed now says on the bag, guaranteed to be less than 20 parts per million aflatoxins. We tested some of those bags and all of them were true to their word. So we recommend buying aflatoxin tested feed rather than just any old feed. In terms of gastrointestinal parasites, that Giardia that we talked about, we definitely recommend that after visiting feeders or handling any harvested animals, you wash your hands, maybe even use gloves while you're doing it to try and reduce the risk that you pick up one of the parasites and then accidentally give it to yourself or your family. You know, you just brought up something that uh, I think we need to clarify a little bit more. You know, you, you harvest a deer and you gotta drag it out of the woods. And what, do you, what part do you grab for that purpose? Oftentimes you grab... Well, now, it depends, Steve. Yes. Did, did you harvest a buck or a doe? Yes. If you harvested a buck, you probably grab the antler. That's right. But yeah, if you're harvesting a doe, you're gonna grab it by the foot, you're gonna grab it by the hoof. And often if you have help, you and a buddy, you're each gonna grab a leg and, and start dragging. Yeah, when you get to the truck, you grab all four legs and, and heave it up. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get exposed to whatever's on their hooves, their feet, their toes. And uh, if there's a feeding program, there could be all those critters you've been talking about, the Giardia and, and uh, Coccidia, Coccidia, Strongulids. And Stuff from the poop. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you get back, I mean, the kids are you know, the, really the young kids are like, oh, look at, look at the deer and, and touching the deer. And, and uh, you know, little kids do what little kids do. They stick their fingers in their mouths. And mm -hmm. so you're not gonna necessarily cause them to get sick, but let's be careful to keep them from having the opportunity to get sick. I think that's real, uh, a real good point to, to clarify there, Steve, is that Deer hunters, people listening to this, deer hunters, managers, they have a lot of experience doing exactly what you described. You and I included, we've drug out a lot of deer, grabbing them by the hooves and we didn't get sick. And so what we're not saying here that if you do this, this is gonna happen, you're gonna get sick. All we're saying is again, coming back to the whole issue of supplemental feeding and disease is that you are engaging in a behavior that increases the likelihood yes. of it happening. And so we're just raising an awareness of you are going to increase the chances of uh, you getting sick by doing that. And so just use precaution, just use some common sense, change yeah. your behavior a little bit and you're going to far reduce the odds of something bad happening to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know we have another student, Bo, who looked at vegetation effects associated with feeders and he, we're going to have him come on another show mm -hmm. and uh, talk about how feeders can impact the vegetative community. Yeah, exactly. That'll be another good one. Mm -hmm. Any close, did, did we kind of, uh, I guess, wrap it up there with best management practices, Miranda? Do you think I think we covered all our bases there? We did. I mean, the one thing we haven't mentioned is something that probably people are hearing a lot right now is ticks are emerging, as you know. There are basic precautions you can take anytime you go into the woods to protect yourself against ticks. Insect repellent, treating your clothes with permethrin, and of course, doing tick checks once you're inside. Okay. Well, thank you both. Miranda, thank you for all the, like we began with, the blood, sweat, and, and tears over the years, uh, past couple summers, engaged in Mississippi summer 
field work. That's never fun. So thanks for your perseverance in, uh, in getting that done. Thank you for this wonderful information you, you've brought to light here. Thanks to NDWFMP Absolutely. For, for funding this, this research. Uh, these are big issues to them uh, as our regulatory agency, management agency. So thanks to them for funding it and, and uh, helping us come up with these questions and finding answers. Yeah, and all of our hunting partners and friends that, that buy guns and shoot ammunition, those federal excise taxes go to fund our research through the State Wildlife Agency. And the landowners that that open the doors for you to come sample yes. on the property. This research have to would do that, so we appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, couldn't do it without them. Okay, well, I guess enough talk about poop. Uh, <laughs> That's all the poop we got. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you both. Uh, appreciate you you coming on the podcast today, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Sounds good. We thank the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation and the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowed financial support of our efforts. We also thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. If you have questions or suggestions, please log on to msudeerlab.com and click on the Deer University tab.